Hi everyone, my name's Rebecca, I'm a fish biologist and ichthyologist but also a PhD student. I specialise and study the evolution of lower card catfishes, which are also known as plex or whiptail catfishes within the aquarium trade. And one of my main focuses is looking at their ecology, their evolution and what these fishes feed on and how it relates to their evolution. So when, one popular topic when it comes to looking at lower carb diets and what you should feed them, a lot of people mention stuff like a variety of vegetables. And I've not got any examples of mushrooms here, but I'm going to talk about them slightly differently. So the diversity of vegetables that many people are very keen on feeding their plex. And this is largely in contrast to either as an addition to their diet, it's discussed, or either as a replacement to dry diets, gel diets, or frozen diets, which obviously I'm not going to bring it out of the freezer. But it also, you've got to remember the diet, actual wild diets that these fishes have evolved to feed on. So the majority of plecos are detritivores or algivores in the wild. Detritivore is kind of a very vague sort of definition, so it could be quite a few things actually, whereas algivores tend to eat mostly obviously algae but there will also be a diversity of bacteria, a diversity of, um, well, sort of like some bryzoa maybe, algae, protozoa, that whole thing. So it also kind of was defined as all which, which is why there's so much of an overlap with those that specialise on algae. And a lot of them will have high volumes of algae in their diet. And the reason that people are looking at vegetables is largely because of the word, well, algae in general. So all of these are actually, well, they're all plants. Um, I'd say they're definitely all angiosperm plants. So these are very modern flowering plants. So when we look at the evolution of plants, um, the, uh, these evolved much later. I think sometime, I think it's around when you started to get like dinosaurs and stuff like that. So they're distantly related to what is closely related to plants and that's green algae. But algae are actually polyphyletic. There's many different species or groups of algae and they're found across protozoa. So they're as closely related to plants sometimes as we are to plants in a way I guess. And then you've also got cyanobacteria which does technically count as an algae in this context because a lot of lower cards do feed on them. And that's actually bacteria. So that's not closely related at all. So if we look at the evolutionary distance, the only ones that are closely related are like the green algae really. And they're not very closely related to these guys at all. But the idea that because they're photosynthetic shouldn't they be similar? Uh, nutritionally, shouldn't they be similar in general? Well that's kind of, the way we look at evolution and the way we look at different groups is very focused on sort of mammals. We see mammals as this massive diversity um, and then it kind of, people kind of group them a little bit more as they get further away from mammals. So plants are much less understood than they should be. So for this reason alone, we shouldn't conflate these with being alternatives to algae because they're not closely related at all. Got uh, like root vegetable, got, I used to know more plant groups, I believe this would be brassicaceae, um, peas and beans I believe for le legumes, so look at lumiaceae I think is it? Um, but, doesn't really matter, but a lot of these groups are very distantly related. We don't really feed much um, of the gymnosperms. The only plant that, well actually, so when we look at low carb diets in the world, some do feed on very small amounts of macrophytic plants, large plants, but not plants like these large plants. Often if you're gonna see plants, you're gonna see what's known as bryophytes, and these are actually mosses in lower carb diets, but they're not particularly common. You rarely find plants like this in their diets, and why? Because there isn't actually that much really in their habitat. And if we look at a lower carb jaw, for example, um, if I get 
this one up. So this is a CT scan. Um, it's probably not going to be the clearest, but they feed in a rasping motion, which means that if they're going to want to feed on something, they kind of have to sort of graze at it. And a lot of the plants in their habitat, they're not going to be able to sort of do that sort of, or it's more, because they've got more mobility of that bottom jaw, they're not really going to be able to scrape so much with that top jaw. And with the plants that, that are found in their habitats, they're not really like a good old chonky plant. It's more like these sort of more threaded plants, I guess, so it could be very small stems and such. Which means that they're not like, um, if you look at traditional plant eating fishes, maybe a paku, which may feed, I guess, on fruit and seeds, and also silver dollars, stuff like that. They've got those chompy teeth that just kind of slice. And also, uh, they've got quite strong lips, whereas law cards aren't really designed as much for not all of them so it depends because they do have that secondary pair of jaws to really feed on plants but many of them are not feeding on these macrophytic large um, plants they're feeding larger on algae as the photosynthetic component but then there will also be those bacteria that um, other bacteria, other protozoa, stuff like that, that they can be feeding on and grazing on. And they do likely partition what they feed on, so feeding on different algae, depending on the species and depending on their teeth, their jaws, their habitat they're actually extracting those from, but also things like sponges, don't forget. Um, but these are basically not closely related and they don't feed on these sorts of things in the world. Most of these sorts of plants do not grow in these sorts of habitats because firstly it's low in light more than often. If it's not low in light it's got very high flow which means that the, um, there's not going to be anywhere to really settle easily. They need something like hold fast you see in big uh, seaweeds which are algae, they're macro algae so large like I guess colonial algae um, and then so it's really difficult habitat for plants like that to grow and they're not going to be growing um, well particularly fruits and vegetables a lot of them so there's no point really I would say potentially ha putting seeds so much you're more splitting up but then there's quite a lot of there's a quite a few flowering plants, but it's a really difficult habitat for macrophytic plants or traditional plants to grow. One sign of true aquatic plants is that a lot of them don't actually have that much rigidity. So you take them out of the water and they just flop over because they don't have very strong uh, cellulose walls or I guess they might have lignin, but they don't have that much strength to their body. And it's just a really challenging habitat, not just that, but fresh water is naturally very low in nutrients. So they're fighting for the nutrients and also against bacteria, algae that grow much faster. And so it's not really reliable to even say that they could feed on them. There are some that will and do, but there's not many. And if it is, it's usually bryophytes, which is mosses. So what, what about replacements? Um, so the main issue here is when we're dealing with vegetables is these have a lot more rigidity, compared, especially like carrots, um, potatoes, they're a lot more difficult to digest than the natural diet of a lot of lower kinds. And obviously carnivores I'm kind of ignoring because people do feed these to carnivores and I think it's largely because fish meal um, the high fish meal diets do cause quite a bit of bloating it seems and it's kind of to pass it through but they're not going to be feeding like this is really difficult to digest and you might notice if you feed a lot of vegetables you might notice a lot of waste a lot of people conflate waste with it being fed on and that is not really the truth to be honest because just because something's passing through the gut doesn't mean it has any purpose in the gut. If there's a lot of solid waste, it's likely being, like, these fish do have 
two pairs of drawers so they can break down food items but if it's passing through especially in those alcohols that have very long guts there's very little being processed and I find that even with courgette um, bell peppers mine don't touch mushrooms I don't find it with but I'll discuss them later and that's the same so these cellulose cell wall well the cell walls in general so these are really difficult to digest if you're naturally feeding on algae and it's not just that it's the cell walls or the fact that they've got more rigidity it's the fact they haven't got the enzymes because these are mostly well caught anyway but if not it takes ages to um, evolve a totally different way of feeding um, so it it just they're not processing it because it's just passing in and out most of it hence why there's so much waste because most of that's not being digested so a lot of people might have issues with saying things that oh there is not being diet my fish aren't producing waste and it's like there's kind of that balance between too much and too little and also with it because these aren't going to cause bloating they're just more difficult to digest um, and the final thing I guess really to do with these is that their nutritional profile is very different to algae's and the natural diet of well herbivorous herbivorous because it's, it's an awful term to use because it's so if people say that just because a fish is herbivorous it should be fed this then why aren't you feeding seeds to guinea pigs and feeding horses I don't know um, just lettuce or something what why are you not um, or feeding hamsters just grass like herbivory is such a diverse and there's so because it kind of in the aquatic sense it crosses over different things the nutritional composition is very different algae are much higher in protein there's a very different vitamin and nutrient profile to these plants um, so like beans might be, uh, beans tend to be I guess a little higher in protein but they're really not going to compare to algae. Uh, there's some nutritional things that these do not have like there is a pseudo vitamin B12 in spirulina. Um, it's just you don't even need to like research the nutrition they're not the same taxonomically they're not the same, structurally they're not the same the fishes haven't evolved to feed on them and nutritionally the, like, there's this idea that protein is what matters when you look at any other diet it, for any other animal you don't just go straight to the protein content because it's the source of the protein that really matters and algae are very high in protein that's what these fishes are naturally feeding on and feeding a different source in protein doesn't mean that protein is as accessible and maybe it's going out as waste and it's different because proteins are formed of stuff called amino acids like the building blocks of the um, proteins different amino acids are useful for different animals um, and found in different foods so feeding this isn't really ideal because first it's very low in protein in comparison but also it's very difficult to access so that very difficult to digest and very different from what they're actually feeding on in the wild um, and also like it's just the nutrition is totally different Al algae is just high in protein even the diet that has fish meal um, the, the paper on fish meal has like a diet which is like fish meal cereals that lot performs as well as just one species of algae fed to um, ancestors. these don't compare and I would argue that if you're just relying on these how long do your fishes live are they living 10 years 15 years 20 years 25 years um, compared to some which are fed a more rounded diet even a fish meal well even that more generic fish diet is going to be better than just feeding vegetables they do not rely on these to feed your low carb because it's not remotely similar 
So the one exception. I have a jar of these for a reason because I need to actually make them into a powder. But mushrooms are totally different. So mushrooms, as we know, they are fungi. Fungi are more closely related to animals. They're, it's all, they're, it's almost like across the group of protozoa, then there's like two little groups. Fungi are actually found in lower carb diets. Not too often, but they're quite difficult to look for. But they are found in the diets of Panax, so Royal Plecos, Panaculus, which is Clown Plecos, Tiger Plecos, Flash Pleco, Mustard Spot Pleco, um, etc. Panax, um, no, not Panax. Hypossimus Cochidon group, so that's the Rusty Plecos, uh, like Sonne, Basilisco, um, Chimera. So this fungi are found in the diet and it is an awful generalisation to say that mushrooms are the same as the hyphae of some aquatic fungi. Firstly, we don't know what fungi that is. Secondly, these are the fruiting bodies, not the hyphae. I wouldn't be able to say if the nutrition is the same, but we don't see rotting wood in the aquarium and not many people will add it because it's probably quite polluting. But this is probably the closest we can get to it. So I'm not afraid to say that fungi or mushrooms might be quite a good addition to try out, especially for a diversity of different species. And even that whole, not just Panaculus, but maybe the Percolto group in general, you could give it a go because we don't know too much of a detail to their diet. Um, like there's hints, they seem, um, especially like detritus, algae, seeds, they potentially could be going, I would say maybe more sponges and stuff like that. Um, but also Panax, I wouldn't be afraid to add them to the, their somewhat closer relatives, so Barium Cistrus, Hemian Cistrus Medians, stuff like that. But these are, mushrooms are actually an alternative and a lot of people say oh but they're really low in nutrition firstly that's conflated or confusing water content with nutrition so uh, cucumbers aren't that bad it's just they've got a higher water content if you dehydrate a lot of these you'll find out how much they shrink like these this will just go down by to like i'd say quarter of that size Carrots probably much less, but ju don't judge water content or why not to feed something. Um, unless you're really comparing true like nutritional values and stuff like that, it's not really a fair comparison. Because it's kind of like, because as you've got to compare actually how many vitamins per that 100 grams and stuff like that which also comparing accessibility of them, they're not, none of them are going to be that great, but I guess inside of a cucumber might be slightly easier to digest. You've also got to consider the age of it. So like with anything, if it's soft, it's easier to digest. It also means it breaks down quicker in the aquarium. Um, frozen obviously tends to break down quicker, I'd say, but there is a wide range. Like, there's one thing I'm going to say about feeding vegetables is that vegetables aren't entirely bad when it comes to bulking out your fish or getting them feeding in the first place. If they're refusing to feed and you've got the passion, you just want a bit extra, these aren't bad. I use courgette and mushrooms all the time just to keep my barren sisters feeding so they get fed once or twice a day on the repashi and then this gets left in maybe once a week. Not this whole chunk, but a good, like, half of that will get left in. And it's not a bad idea if they're going to feed on it to leave it as something to bulk them out. But bear in mind, they're going to be leaving a lot of solid waste because they're not going to be digesting all of it or a lot of it. So it's not all bad, but do consider how you're feeding it, why you're feeding it, and the waste levels. Um, so I'll end this video here. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Um, thank you for watching and if you like my videos, please comment, like and subscribe.